Probably the main thing people notice about my paintings is the lighting. That seems to be what captures their eyes. And that's really the way I like it, because lighting for me is one of the most enjoyable parts of painting. And a lot of people have a really hard time with lighting. It scares them a little bit, it confuses them. I don't know what. Uh, they tend to be intimidated by it and simply do the same lighting on every scene that they paint. And there's really no need to do that. Lighting is not terribly complicated. It's not that hard to figure out. There's just a few tricks you learn, and once you establish them, it's just painting form. Now, I'm not saying it's really easy, but with time and some practice and observation, it's really possible to pick up and push your lighting as a really important part of your paintings. Now, I've already talked about a couple keys to lighting, uh, separating your darks from your lights and establishing that necessary warm, cool relationship in them. But there's, of course, tons of other things. Um, since so many of my images, including this one, rely on drama, I think that's an important thing for me to describe how to do, how to make a light seem really bright. And how you make something seem bright in an image is not that you make it white. It's that you make everything else in the image dark. And you establish the lighting not by making everything so bleached out that it's lost all of its detail, but instead by keying everything else darker, it will seem light by contrast. That is an essential key to lighting, and if you get that, you really got drama down. Now the smaller the area you make that light, the more impact it's going to have. So if you isolate one little beam of light in your whole landscape and make the rest of it dark, that one little spot is really going to grab your eye and get that really strong kick of light. As you can see, I've started to kind of zoom in and begin to work out some of the details occasionally. I've got the focal area of that door in the upper, well, left, but it's in the upper right now because uh, I can't seem to stop flipping the image. But anyways. Uh, I'm trying to work on the detailing in that kind of scene. One of my problems a while ago that I had was that I really liked working on the focal areas of the scene, and then I just kind of haphazardly did the rest and didn't really care about it because, well, everyone wants to pay attention to the focal area, because that's what counts. The problem with doing that is that the areas that you don't spend time on, the areas that you just kind of, you know, shoddily paint, don't spend much time on them, they're kind of rough, they're kind of ugly, that's where everyone's going to look. They're going to look exactly where you don't want them to look. So you have to spend enough time on the unimportant areas so that the viewer will just ignore them and look at the areas that you really want them to look at. A great way to force yourself to do this is to work on the rest of the image before you do the fun stuff, before you do the focal area. One of my teachers in school made me do this, and admittedly it took me a whole semester to listen to his advice, but when I finally did, it was fantastic advice. Of course, now I've gotten to the point that I enjoy the background slash landscape slash environment so much that when I'm doing a character piece even, I'll spend more time on the background than I will on the character. And this can of course get me in a fair bit of trouble because well, then the character comes out looking pretty bad and they're in a beautiful environment. So we all have stuff to work on, I guess. Here you can see I'm going around with the smudge tool and just cleaning up some of the things. Since I don't really turn off the line layer ever, I sometimes have some of the stray lines from my original rough sketch in there, and it's a good idea to clean those things up. And now you can see me start to waste my time on a little figure over to the right. I'd originally had this idea of having like a couple dead bodies on the side, maybe covered in snow or something, but for some reason it just never worked out. So you'll see me waste a, quite a bit of time over here just fiddling with things. I'll try to paint a figure, and then I'll try to paint a skull, and it'll just look really weird. It'll be this little face staring at you on the side, and... In the end, I just paint it out, and I'm much happier with it. Uh, it happens to me a lot when I'm painting, that I'll have this great idea, and then I try to paint it, 
I'll waste a while of time on it and never be happy with it. And once I paint it out, I'll actually be happy. So I guess the lesson to all that is don't be afraid to change your image even if you're sold on an idea. Uh, sometimes they just don't work out. Sort of in the vein of the lighting discussion is atmosphere. It's really essential in landscapes and environments, uh, also crucial in other paintings, even character pieces. Uh, establishing depth in a piece is probably almost as important as establishing a uh, good form in a piece. Getting the piece to recede and come forward really helps the viewer to be immersed in the scene. Depth is most easily achieved by using atmospheric perspective, and I'm sure most of you already know what atmospheric perspective is, but just for the sake of clarity, I'll repeat a lot of it. Uh, essentially, when things get further away uh, due to there being atmosphere, thus the name, in between you and that object, the values will both get lighter and darker. Essentially, they'll go towards a mid-tone. You'll lose the contrast there. Things will get slightly grayer, maybe bluer, depending on the time of day, atmosphere, or whatnot. And things will even get a little bit softer and lose a lot of their detail. You've really got to pay attention to these rules as you're working. It's easy to get caught up with making nice high contrast images that you go all contrasty in the background and lose all sense of depth. And if you don't have depth in the image, the lighting itself won't read. So you've got to be willing to lose things in the background to fade out that detail, to soften the edges, and lose a lot of the contrast just to be able to sell that lighting in your foreground. I think I forgot to mention it earlier, but this whole video is sped up quite a bit. Uh, I don't paint this fast. Um, in fact, this video sped up about five times. So the total painting time for this piece was right around five hours. I do paint fairly quickly, but not this quickly. The thing with doing finished pieces is really you shouldn't worry about how long it takes. It's, it's a really common question to ask an artist, how long did that take you to do? And really the answer should be is, how long do you need it to take? Uh, a really complicated, detailed piece with finely rendered stuff is going to take a while. And there's really no cheating that. For a long time I was hoping there would be some way to cheat that to be able to get that really detailed piece all over really fast, but it doesn't really work out that way. There are some tricks, some techniques you can learn that will speed things along, that will make implying details a lot easier and faster, but in the end, if you want a detailed finished piece, then you need to just put in the hours and work on it. You may have noticed I've been modifying the size and the shape of some of the snow areas and the rock areas here. And the reason I'm doing that is I was looking at the piece and it bothered me how similar all the shapes were looking. All the rock shapes and all the snow shapes seem to be relatively the same size. And if you do that, it tends to make your piece look really monotonous and you'll lose all the scale and all the visual interest to your piece if that happens. So it's good to vary and have big areas and small areas and everything in between so that, well, it's just to make it an interesting image. And I just wanted to point out that painting snow and painting rocks is one of the most instantly gratifying things you can work on in a landscape painting. It's very easy to make something look like snow-covered rocks. You just put some dark values in there, put some light values on the top planes, and boom, you've got snow. Uh, getting the complexities of the color isn't really terribly complicated. Uh, it's just something you should keep in mind to vary your colors, to add in blues and yellows and grays and everything in between. But really, snow is just a fun thing to paint. Now, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I'm really bad with my layer management. So you can see here that I made a quick selection so that I could sharpen up the edges around this foreground rock. 
Uh, it's important to make it look like your brush strokes in the background are actually going behind the objects in the foreground. If you just paint up to the edges and work around them, it'll tend to flatten out your image and make it look like a painting and not look like the scene that you're actually working on. You can see here I'm adding a few more figures into my composition. I thought it needed a little bit more flow to it. Uh, I haven't really talked much about composition this whole time, and that's because composition is one of those things in art that is really subjective. You can learn all the principles, all the rules of composition, but there are just so many beautiful pieces out there that defy every one of those rules that they only go so far. That's not to say you shouldn't learn them and study them, because I do think that is really important. But at the same time, my general rule when working on a composition is to go with whatever feels right. If it feels comfortable and the image just seems to work for you, then you've probably got a pretty strong composition. If something's really bothering you, it just looks weird and you don't know what it is, that's the time I think you break out those rules of composition and try to figure out, well, okay, what can I do to make this feel better? So as you can see, I'm starting to work up these foreground figures. Uh, I put it off for a while just because, well, I'm lazy and I was having a lot more fun painting the environment than worrying about figures. There's something really complicated and time consuming about figures that is maybe the reason I ended up liking it environments more than figurative work. With figures you really have to worry about proportions and getting the structure and the forms to read right, not to mention the gesture and maybe even the motions and all that. With a rock or something you just paint a nice looking rock and try to get it to look like a rock. And if you paint it a little bit disproportionate it's okay because it's just a rock. I already mentioned earlier that I really love to flip my canvas, which you've probably noticed by now, and you're probably really disoriented on which way this image is supposed to be. Uh, in fact, there's some times where I'll be working on an image for a while, and I will forget which way my original piece was supposed to be. And that's kind of okay. Occasionally I will end up uh, picking the reverse as the better view. Uh, sometimes it'll just be a better composition that way. Uh, but most of the time I'll stick with the real one. But anyways, I would really recommend, if you haven't already, to set up a shortcut to do that flipping. It's very easy and very quick and will help your paintings a lot. Especially if you're doing figurative work and need to check to make sure the features are all lining up and everything's proportional, it'll save you so much grief. But beyond that, to discuss a few technical issues, I would also say to learn your shortcuts in general. Uh, painting digitally is very fast, but a lot of that speed advantage only happens when you fully understand all of the shortcuts and can use them. So if you find yourself doing the same action again and again during your painting, figure out a shortcut for it and save yourself a lot of time. Another trick for Photoshop in particular is you'll notice my little color sliders over there are the HSV sliders, the hue, the saturation, and value sliders. I think the default in most versions of Photoshop is to have RGB sliders. And RGB sliders are not really that useful for painters. Uh, the HSV ones, at least for myself, really make sense. If I want to adjust just the value of a color, I can do that. If I want to adjust the saturation, if I want to adjust the hue, it's all on a slider and it makes a lot of sense. So if you haven't done that, I'd really recommend it. That's how I choose most of my colors and it saves me a lot of time. 